Okay, well, thanks for inviting me here to talk about Disc Beast and talk about some of the things we have found with Disc Beast. Uh, my name is Chris Evans, um, aka Scary Beasts. Just a brief intro about myself and my retro journey, um, just to just to show that uh, I have the right creds. Here's a picture of me uh, with my trusty BBC Master Compact back in the day. I had an Acon Electron, uh, then this BBC Master Compact. Um, as you can see. Uh, on the screen, the TV screen there, I've, um, I've copied some graphics from some other games and turned them into a title screen, trying to make my own game. And that is as far as I ever got trying to make games. I would make a title screen that would usually say how great the game was going to be. And then that was it. Um, I had a career in computer security and currently I'm spending a lot of time fiddling with retro stuff and having a, having a lot of fun. So let's do the origin story. This is my origin story in terms of how I got interested in original disc preservation. And before I, I, I get onto that, I just want to give a, a hat tip to bbcmicro.co.uk. Uh, this is an excellent resource. It's amazingly slick and polished. And it's somewhere you can just point someone new to the BBC to sort of show them what it can do. And the, you know, the quality of presentation there and, and the website is, is just excellent. Um, that said, I got introduced, I don't know, maybe a year ago now or, or so, to, um, to this archive that Bill Carr has, and it's amazing. It's an archive of FSD files, where these FF FSD files represent um, a view of the original disk, as opposed to the, the disks that are used on bbcmicro.co.uk, which tend to be a little bit more curated, a little bit more polished. And these original disks, FSD, uh, uh, the F in the FSD archive, they're not curated or polished, so you get to experience the discs, original warts and all. And I found, um, I'm skipping ahead now here, but uh, I found that playing the original discs with warts and all brought back some of the memories in a way that playing the more slick, polished versions did not, and that sort of really resonated with me. So to sort of keep going uh, on the FSD journey, I added FSD and then HFE support to, to Beebjit, which is the emulator I wrote, so that we have an emulator that is capable of running original disks so that other people can have the same experiences that I've been enjoying recently. And I hope in time we'll be able to add support for original protected formats to some of the other emulators once we've sort of learned what the, what the things are we have to do to get it right. Let's, let's give an example of what I mean by playing an original game disc, warts and all. So my favorite game, um, no secret to those who know me, is, is Exile from back in the day. And if you play it on, on bbcmicro.co.uk, you'll, you'll get this title screen. And the title screen, will, then it'll go black, the title screen will disappear, and then the sort of game loader will start, and then the game will start. But if you play the original disc, you get this, and then the disc drive sort of clonks away, and you get this, and then it loads a bit more, and you get this, and then um, this is sort of, quotes encrypted data, you know, copy protection, and then um, it would decrypt this encrypted data whilst it's, some of it's visible on the screen, so you get this. Um, and just the first time I saw this again for the first time in decades just brought back the memory of the excitement of loading the game that I just hadn't had um, for decades, you know, even though I played the game a lot. Um, from the Stairway to Hell archive from bbcmicro.co.uk. So that, that got me thinking. Uh, and of course, once you've got past the sort of pre-game loader, you then also, when playing an original protected disc, you get this, which is another part of the copy protection that has been long since stripped out of, of, the, um, of the versions that most of us play. So, you know, I, I had to go and dig out my copy of Exile. Uh, there should be one visible on the a prop on the shelf behind me that I brought out. But you know, you can sort of get your original Exile novella out and type in the word and you know, with the anticipation of playing the game, and then you hit enter and, and then you're in the world of Exile. 
So that's one thing that got me got me really thinking about this. There are some other things that got me thinking about this. There are some really interesting threads we've been having recently and not so recently on the startup forums. Um, one that caught my attention that I never knew of back in the day uh, because Repton 2 was just too hard for me. Um, but there's there's the case of Repton 2 and the missing diamond. And it, there really was an original release of Repton 2 uh, where there was just a missing diamond. And you know the way you complete this game, I believe, is you collect all of the Earth segments and all of the diamonds. And with a missing diamond, you just uh, can't complete the game. So there was a re-release. And that got me thinking, oh, cool, where do I... Where can I go to get disc A and disc B? Um, where disc A is the original release with the missing diamond and disc B has the diamond. You know, maybe there's some other changes that they made, some other fixes that would be really interesting from a digital archaeology point of view. So this is another thing that got me sort of thinking in the same direction. Um, and here's another interesting thing that I, I expect many of you know, maybe some of you don't, but um, here's an article I recommend reading. I've got the, the link down at the bottom here. And I, I will be releasing these slides um, to the A bug thread um, once I finish this presentation. But it's uh, an article about Elite, of course. And it sort of goes on to say that the original Aconsoft um, release was, was plagued by an interesting bug, a cheat, where if you tried to um, buy a laser you already had, it would um, just give you cash. And you could do that loads of times and get effectively infinite cash. And how Aconsoft, you know, is moved ahead, re-released with that bug fixed. So I was thinking, well, this is one of the most iconic games in video gaming history. So surely somewhere there's the, the original discs archive where it's like, here's the release with this famous bug and here's the fixed release. And But um, looking around, I, I, I couldn't really find some of these things I was, I was hoping to find. So that got me thinking about if there's something I could do uh, to, to help um, archive some of these, some of these variants. So goals, that gave me, so all of these things coming together gave me some ideas and I turned those into some goals. So goal zero, this is kind of a pre-goal before getting too involved in doing lots of work. It's nice to sometimes collect a bit of data to, to um, confirm your hypothesis. My hypothesis in this case being that there's tons of original, uh, sorry, tons of interesting and historical data hidden out there on disks that maybe we're not capturing as a community because we've captured the game once, but maybe there are other variants of that game out there or other interesting things that we could be could be capturing and maybe we're not archiving them well. So a lot of this presentation is to sort of come to a conclusion on that, which I, I, will, I will do so shortly, and I, I think you might agree with me. Um, obviously, assuming that we prove this hypothesis, I want to help archive this stuff well. Um, providing guidance and tooling to enable greater participation is probably the single biggest leverage thing I can do as an individual. So I've been focusing on the, the tooling and investigation side of things. Um, and if we do decide there's some things here to, to archive, uh, we'll need to host the material. Um, also with an eye to longevity, so this doesn't go, go missing as time goes on. So in terms of the technology goals for the tooling I mentioned, um, we already talked about this in some of the uh, Q&A in the previous talk, but it would be great if we can easily fingerprint disks so that you can just, as easily as possible, grab a disk and say, is this disk known to us or is it a, a new variant perhaps? That's something I've been working on. Making it easy to capture disks is important. Um, the previous talk was, was excellent. I mean, getting, a, getting one of those BBC FTC boards is an easy way to capture disks accurately and to a high fidelity. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna recommend that. Um, it's also nice, not everyone has an original machine, right? So if you have these original disks, we need an emulator that's capable of playing them. So that's, um, so Beebjet plays all known protected original disks that I've found. And I'm hoping that we can take some of that technology out of Beebjit and push it into some of the other emulators that are more accessible, maybe maybe JSB, maybe even uh, BBM, since that seems to be very popular within the community. But yeah, uh, make it easy, easier to participate, I think is the biggest leverage item. And I'm, I'm going to hopefully um, show some of the tooling here that might make it easier for you to participate. So, quick Disk Beast demo. I'm going to run Disk Beast under emulation for this demo. Um, 
I do have a real machine, but that's well away from the Wi-Fi access point, so I don't want to risk presenting from over there. And uh, BeebJIT's emulation of, of disk controllers is reasonably accurate, so the experience you're going to see here is going to be the same as what you'd get uh, with real hardware. So, load up Beeb, uh, sorry, we'll load up um, Disk Beast, and I've got Disk Beast here set up as my computer is set up. So the, there's a real disk drive with a real disk in it as drive zero. And I use a GoTech as drive one because that's a way I find very convenient of getting files um, off the BBC and into the, into the modern world. So to use this piece, you just sort of tell it which drive you're interested in. So initialize drive zero. There we go. It, it has auto detected a 1770 floppy disk controller. It has found out the speed of my drive, which is rotating at a um, absolutely perfect 3125 bytes um, per uh, per revolution. Um, obviously this is an emulator so it, it's got a very accurately spinning floppy drive. So to um, and to capture the disk uh, that's all you want to do is uh, you just type that and off it goes. Uh, it's one of the problems of disk pieces is very, very slow, but it, it does try to be accurate. So you can see it's sort of counting as it reads each sector. That's it doing CRCs. CRCs are kind of slow on the BBC, unfortunately, uh, but it's doing a disk CRC. So that it can tell you if you've got any disk errors you want to look at. And it's also doing a sort of a wider 32-bit CRC to give you a fingerprint. Uh, now, the good thing about this being under emulation is you can sort of hit a go a bit faster key. Uh, oh, it should be faster than that anyway. And there it goes and it's gonna, oh, yeah, it's found some interesting stuff and it sort of gives you some pretty colors. And then at the end of the day, it'll give you the CRC and um, in theory, if we look at drive one, there's a bunch of files it's emitted that can be taken into the modern world and, and stitched into an HFE, which is a pretty good file format for protected disks uh, with a little C tool that's um, also released alongside Disk Beast. Uh, you know, Disk Beast does some other things. Um, I think we're gonna see some of those on some, some of the upcoming slides. You can also just sort of seek around the disk and read sectors and dump sectors and read sector headers with some commands. So it makes it very easy to sort of poke around and see what, see what you're looking at. Um, but yeah, the point of Disk Beast hopefully is it's very easy to use. It will give you a CRC right then and there so you can see if it's a new disk or not. And it gives you a way to get, to capture a real original disk and get it into the, the modern world. Let's go back to here. And just to give some examples of the output of, of Disk Beast, um, some pretty colors. So. Uh, Probably not surprisingly, some of the sort of craziest splurges of color you're going to see are from um, from the disk copying software back in the day, because they obviously they wanted to copy disks really well, but make it a little bit tricky to to copy for someone to copy themselves. And there's, I guess there's some irony in that in some ways. Uh, but on the left, there's Disk Duplicator Three, um, possibly the, the the best copier in some regards. Um, all sorts going on there, even some red blobs, which usually mean disk errors, but sometimes they can be deliberate disk errors um, with the disk working fine. And on the right is Vector 2, um, which was a 1770 one base copier, I think. I think there was a 8271 mode as well, but that has a very interesting disk surface. Uh, you know, and um, this piece tries to show you some pretty colors just to give you a quick sort of finger in the air in terms of what, what you're looking at. So how does Disk Beast work? Um, on the right here, there's a little fragment from the um, 1770 data sheet. It's a fairly simple chip in terms of the API it offers you to, to hit it directly. Um, elegant in some ways, and um, it has things like read sector, write sector, seeking and stepping, um, which is all you need really. Uh, and also a couple of interesting um, commands, read track and write track. 
Uh, write track is needed, is used commonly uh, for formatting. Uh, read track isn't, wasn't used that much back in the day, but it sounds great, doesn't it? You know, oh, I want to an archive a disk, let's just call read track, and then next track, read track. Um, which, sounds, which sounds simple, but we'll, we'll get on to why perhaps it isn't. Uh, it also needs the read address command there. So read address is a, a strange name. That I, I would describe that as reading the sector headers as opposed to reading sector data. Uh, the reason you need that as well as read track is that um, read track just gives you a stream of data bytes. And if you recall from the excellent previous talk we had, uh, real disk surface is comprised of not just uh, data bytes, but also clock bytes. And you need those to tell when where an actual special marker is for the sector header. So you kind of need to read the track and then get the sector headers and then sort of match them up so that you can be sure of what the real disk surface contain. Still sounding quite simple, right? But <laughs> read track is not reliable um, across many different tests and machines and chips. Uh, it, um, it's not reliable for a couple of reasons. One is fairly in intrinsic. If you've got a disk written sector by sector, you sort of, um, when the disk is sort of writing a, a chunk of a track as opposed to a whole track, it sort of leaves a bit of noise when it when it's sort of firing up and, and powering down the, the disk head. And that noise will cause retract to, to lose sync. And in the process of regaining sync, you might see a bunch of bytes that are a little bit strange. Uh, but even when it's uh, got a, a, a byte it's sure about it like say a sector header byte it sometimes just returns the wrong byte so um, not the end of the world if you know it's there and what pattern that takes you just you can fix it up but you need to be aware of it read address is really unreliable this one's quite strange um, but when you're when you're looking for sector headers you're sort of um, searching for a needle in the haystack if you will and um, it seems overly keen to see a needle in the haystack where, where there shouldn't be one. And it depends on the disk. Uh, it may depend on, on the controller. We're not really sure yet. But um, some disks, you'll, it'll just give you extra sector headers that just, just don't really just don't exist. Um, and there's a couple of different situations it'll do that in. So you need to take care of that. And that's a bit trickier to take care of. Like you don't want to squash a real sector header. Um, also, if you find yourself reading an unformatted track, which is quite common for, for a disk not to be fully used, and the unused bits may be unformatted, um, all the copy protection may have an unformatted track in the middle of the disk. Uh, trying to read that, it, it may decide that, in fact, it sees a few sector headers, maybe. Uh, sometimes they'll come and go. I, I call them ghosts. So you need to sort all of that out. Um, and then you're kind of getting there but then the timing of the bytes you get back is, is not constant. Um, and this is because the rotational speed of the disk varies as it rotates. And this occurs both when the disk was written and it occurs when the disk is read. So when you're trying to line up the things coming back from read track and the things coming back from read sector headers or read address, there's some wobble there. So you can't just sort of line them up strictly. You'll get, you, you, you'll get some misses. You've got to sort of, uh, you know, drift the window of what you're matching to what. Um, but once you've done all those things, you can get a pretty decent disk surface that caters for all known BBC copy protection schemes, including the tricky ones. Um, and that's straight out of a unmodified original hardware machine, which is, which is kind of cool. Um, a couple of other things you have to worry about. Sometimes you'll get disk errors. Uh, is that a real disk error? In which case you might want to do a retry and Disk Beast uh, does do some retries to try and help you out. Or is it a deliberate error? There's a couple of different copy protection schemes where there were deliberate disk errors on the actual disk itself, um, including weak bits, uh, an interesting copy protection scheme used a lot by Sherston Software. Uh, is the disk 40 track or 80 track? Um, sometimes it's not obvious. You may have a flippy disk 40 track, this side 80 track. The other side that's usually as it says on the tin if you've got a dual 4080 compatible disc uh, that doesn't tell you anything sometimes the disc underlying that is a 40 track surface sometimes it's an 80 track surface sometimes it's it's a mixture of both 
So Disc Beast does try and work out what it is for you to make your life easier, but um, there's a chance uh, it might get it wrong. If it does get it wrong, it tries to err on the side of capturing an 80-track disc so that data is not lost. You can easily discard the interim tracks, but you can't invent interim tracks if you don't capture the data in the first place. So uh, Disc Beast does try to give you a fingerprint of a disc so that we can look at whether a disc is known to us or not, or if it's new. So it, it, it's got a CRC32 based fingerprint. Uh, the challenge here is that all disks are unique. Uh, every disk, even if they've got the same data on them, they're still unique because of just wobble on the on the drive when they were recorded and alignment of the drive and and the was the index hole slightly out of line on the drive when it was recorded. You know, these are very analog things. So each disk is unique. So um, you can't you can't just sort of CLC32 all the bits on the surface because every disk would be unique and that, that's, that's not much use to us. So uh, with this sort of thing, you've just got to pick something, go with it and see if it works. And uh, what, what I've gone with is that the CLC32 for a track is just the sequence of bytes within a sector. And the CLC32 of the disk is the just the sequence of the CLC32 of the tracks. Um, the challenge here is to be sensitive enough to significant changes of the disk and, and but not trigger on insignificant changes. And this seems to be a good balance. It's, it's working best we know so far. Uh, it seems to be identifying variants. We, don't, we aren't aware of any schemes where it would sort of discard a variant, although you could sort of invent one in your head. Uh, we haven't found any in the wild yet. Um, and a couple of things we had to tweak. So if there's a sector with a CRC, with a CRC I should say CLC 16 error. Uh, that does not contribute to the checksum because um, for something like a weak bits protection, then the um, every time you read the sector, you'll get different data back, right? And that's no good for a fingerprint. Also, the um, the duplication markers that you get at the at the 81st or 41st track on the disk, they're unique to each disk because they have a duplication date and time with one second resolution usually. So if you include those in a fingerprint, that's also no good. Uh, but those sectors all tend to have CLC errors. The, the CLC is just not written correctly. So that, this technique just discards those. Uh, and unformatted tracks contribute C a zero to the CLC32. So we can change this uh, if we have to, but it seems fit for purpose right now. And we also have a, a, a body of captures based on this. Uh, and it's, it's looking good. Um, feedback welcome, um, if I've not thought of some, some corner cases. So when we see different fingerprints from a couple of different disks that are nominally the same title, what are some of the reasons that might be going on here? So uh, one reason would be that the game took a fix or an improvement. Um, that's just, this is one of the more exciting reasons for a variant. It's the, it's the Repton 2 missing diamond case. It's the uh, elite infinite cache cheat bug case. So if you get a variant, and it's this type of variant, that's really interesting for, for the history of the game. Very common is, um, is changes due to compatibility reasons. So um, a lot of disks had to do a re-release to add support for the 1770 disk controller. Uh, Elite is an example. The original Elite disk uh, doesn't load on a 1770, um, or it does with some of the modern DFSs if you use a magic hidden secret key combination at the start, which is quite interesting. But the disk just will just won't will just fail to load on a 1770. Um, a lot of games came out just when the master was getting released, so there were a lot of re-releases to make the game work on a on a master. A lot of re-releases because uh, the you know the game seemed to work, but then you know there was a bunch of people that had a Watford DFS ROM and that didn't like the copy protection and so on. Surprisingly common uh, is incomplete mastering. So uh, if you write a if you write a disk commercially on top of a, 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 a well on top of the, the disk you put in, um, there, we found a lot of cases where the mastering process only writes the tracks it has to, maybe for speed. You know, you're trying to crank a bunch of disks through a commercial machine with a hopper on it, um, and uh, but but therefore, would you assume that the tracks that aren't written were empty beforehand? Surprisingly, a lot weren't, and we'll, we'll get to some of that in a minute, and that leads to variants. Um, stale data, uh, so in, in a, a lot of sectors are unused, and if you don't, if you don't um, 
well, it, it's it, this is different from the unformatted case. So this is this is just like there's a, a disk, usually a DFS formatted disk, and there's a bunch of sectors not used by the the game. Uh, what is in those? Um, whatever you know used to be on the disk, and uh, sometimes that's the reason for a variant. Like one one release of the disk, the developer left a bunch of stuff there. I don't know if maybe they noticed it and re-released the disk, but that 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 will trigger a variant, right? Um, makes you wonder how many disks have interesting things on them where there was no re-release. That wouldn't show as a variant, but we can certainly scan every disk that we have for, for interesting stuff on the non-used sectors. Sector Tales is interesting. This is triggered on a few superior software titles, I think, where um, if you have what well, most sectors on the disk are on are sort of partially or a lot of sections on the disk are partially used at the end at the end of every file on, in the DFS formatted disk. Uh, the last sector, if, if the file is not a precise multiple of 256 bytes, the last sector won't have all the bytes actually used for the file. There'll be some some bytes left over. And I would have assumed that those bytes would have always been zeroed by whatever process is writing them. But that's not the case. We're seeing some variants because there's sort of different stale data in these things I call sector tails, which is very interesting. I'm not, I don't yet have a thought on how they may have gotten created. Um, you know, thoughts welcome there. DFS load and execution addresses. So we've got a few uh, less interesting variants where it appears that the only thing that has changed is that they, they fiddled around with the DFS load and execution addresses. Presumably that's a re-release for a compatibility fix with um, with machines with a second processor attached, I think, maybe something like that. That's happened a few times. Um, I think without any other interesting changes at the same time, but I'd have to check. And um, we've had some even less interesting changes where the, the file name padding uh, and the title padding of the disk in, in DFS was changed from spaces to nulls or vice versa, presumably some corner case compatibility fix. So just to give an example of the, um, of what a variant uh, might look like. Here's Exile again. I keep going back to Exile because I, I love it. Um, but on the left is the original Exile release. Um, it's a dual 4080 track compatible surface. It is actually an 80 track surface um, because, uh, because there is a track one that gives a clean read uh, and the other odd tracks don't, but it is, a, it is an 80 track surface, we believe. Um, and later in Exile's life, uh, you get a, a flippy disk, and the disk surface looks very different. It's still got some copy protection on it, but it's less protected. Uh, the original copy protection actually gave, oops, I got my slides misordered there, but the original copy protection on Exile uh, was a headache, I presume, for Superior. I found this um, on the startup forums. Thanks for having dug this out a year or two ago. But um, one of the magazines at the time had this little uh, cartoon about how how uh, quotes uh, strong the Excel protection was, but um, a lot of people couldn't get that disk to work in their machines. One in twenty allegedly, and that must have been a, a bit of a headache for superiors to take all of those returns. So you can see why they went for um, later on they went for a simpler copy protection scheme uh, just to avoid those headaches. Uh, and I think most superior software releases use this a scheme that looks very much like this picture on the right here you know complicated enough that uh, someone can't just use star copy or star backup to back up a disk uh, but simple enough that it is known to work on like your what for dfs is i think you i think opus i think opus challenges gave a lot of trouble and, and and so on another example here this is very common where some um a lot of disks from some software publishers that were not so big had some very fancy copy protection uh, with a presumably a, a, a sort of a the initial commercial production run as seen on the left here indoor sports by uh, by Tynesoft and on the right and even the disc looks fancy for this it's very nice disc with, with some graphics printed directly on the disc and on the right now if you order the disc later in the in the lifetime I, you would get this sort of less fancy looking disc with sort of a, a a printed label looks like someone sort of used scissors to cut the label out and there's no copy protection at all so i've just got this vision of someone in their living room you know in the, in the latter days of the bbc taking mail orders you know one or two a week and just duplicating in their, in their living room what have we what have we found 
So this one's kind of cool. Um, thanks to Bill Carr for having some some early Aconsoft discs that still read that he was willing to, to go and have a look at. But we found out that it seems that every single early Aconsoft 40 track disc is different in the way it's laid out. Uh, all of these pictures here are different. So you've got a column of eight Arcadians, meteors, monsters. None of them, no two are the same. And we just, we were just guessing that no, no two are going to be the same other than by random luck in, in the entire catalog, um, in the entire production run, uh, which is kind of cool, very unusual. It means it's a bit of a headache for preservation. Every disc is going to trigger as a, as a variant. Uh, we can probably, we can probably handle that once we know that it, it's a thing. Uh, but we believe the technique is called crunching, spelled with a K. Uh, how do we know that? Are we just making stuff up? Well, no. Um, one or two of these discs, we found a fragment on, on them. There seems to be an output, not, not the crunching program itself, but an output of the crunching program that sort of, you know, just prints to say how it's going and how the format's going and how the, and, and uh, let's, and let's do some crunching. So you can see there, it says uh, insert disk to be crunched. So um, this is great. Uh, this is this is what you get with variant analysis. You you find the one disk out of the ten that has has these fragments on that are really historically interesting. Um, so that's that's crunching. If anyone has any more historical context on that, that would be really interesting. Just some more Acon soft, some pretty colors just to show you that there's a lot of variance in the way disks were laid out. So sort of left to right, uh, there's one of the original 40 track Aconsoft discs. Um, to the right, there's a Starship Command, they, they changed something up there. Uh, right again, that's Elite. That's the original original Elite disc, um, the one that's not 1770 compatible. You can see a red blob at the end, that's a duplication marker, it's got a date on it, it tells us when that disc was born. Bottom left, um, Arcadian's 4080 compatible, so that's like a, a re-release. Um, once I guess 80 track discs were becoming all the rage, um, and then revs. So this is kind of interesting. I have a question more than I have an answer, but uh, we found the Philosopher's Quest uh, disc had a lot of disc corruption in it. So a lot of these red blobs, disc errors, I think these are real, but the disc is actually reading with, um, with noise and errors. Um, but the disc load's fine, disc load's fine. And if you think about it, this means that the green blobs, which is where the game data is scattered around, are free of errors, and the sort of weird copy protection tracks have errors. So that seems, you can calculate the chance of that happening by chance, and it's like effectively like none. So were they experimenting with some weird early copy protection scheme, and how would they have made that? Like, I don't know. Maybe they sort of write these copy protection tracks and then degauss the disk a bit or something, and then write the real data on top. I, I just don't know. Uh, theory is welcome. Just one of the one of the things we found. Uh, this was fun. You may have followed along this one on the startup forums, but we found a Spy Cat variant, disc variant. Um, Spy Cat is one of those games where some of the files are just DFS files, so you can just diff the files. And um, great work. A lot of people, especially diminished, uh, just looking at what bytes were different and looking at and finding it was a level data change. So the early release had this bug where it was very easy to fall off the end of a, 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 um, of a screen uh, and get stuck, right? Game over, very frustrating, and the later release uh, fixed that. Uh, I don't think we knew of this variant, like a, a gameplay variant, until until we started um, looking at SpyCat variants. I think this popped out with just two, maybe three, or two SpyCat discs. So we didn't have to look too hard to find it, which is, which is kind of cool. We found a UIM variant. This has not yet been tackled or analyzed by everyone, anyone best I know. Uh, this is showing um, one of the commands that can be useful in Disk Beast. It's FCRC, stands for file CRCs. So for a DFS formatted disk, it will just um, CRC32 all of the files on the disk. So you can see what's changed. Sometimes it's less interesting, like loader has changed maybe uh, because they had to make some copy protection fix. Um, but occasionally you find that actual game data files have changed. So here, one of the larger files, like UIM7 is the biggest file, I think the game file, 
is a different file. Um, no one's looked at it yet. It could be really interesting. If, if UIM is one of those games that was one of your favorites back in the day, there's the, you know some, something fun to look into here. Um, another, th another disk piece mode here, the command here is DCRC, it's scrolled off the top. Um, this just gives you a separate CRC for every track, and it's just a quick way of looking uh, at wh which tracks are different. Uh, often you'll get the tracks all the same apart from one which is slightly different, so you can sort of focus in on what, where the differences might be. Um, towards the end of both disks, you see a bunch of track CRCs the same, 6, 7, F0, blah, blah. That is the standard CRC for uh, a track that was formatted but then never written to, so you can sort of see where the interesting data ends. In the case of these two UIM variants, the interesting data ends at different positions, different tracks, which is like a clue. That there's something interesting there. So when we looked at the, when we started to look at what the extra data was, we just found a bunch of source code. Uh, thanks again to Diminished for sort of um, pulling some source code out of these out of these disks. Um, very very interesting that so many of these disks seem to have source code on them. There's probably a lot there that we could find if we just ran some some automatic tooling across some disks. We found a couple of wrecked on one variants. Um, I'm not sure we've looked to see if the game is different. Um, the load is certainly different. One is not master compatible, the other is. Uh, but one of these discs, um, when we captured it in Disc Beast, it gives this warning track past the end. You know what? Uh, you know, looking into it, it seems that the warning's legit. Like past the end of the disc, there is a track that is reads, that is a valid read. It's not a marker, a, a duplication marker, because those have a CRC error. It is a track. And when you look at that track, it's got some fragments referring to karate combat, referring to space fighter, referring to, so it, maybe there's something interesting there, prob prob or probably it's just a loader file for like a compilation perhaps. But um, we think this happened because, um, well, this is what you would see if you took a 40 track drive and tried to write an 80 track disc. So before the drive starts whacking the end of drive sort of metal stopper, it would write track 40, the 41st track, and you would see something something like this. So we think that's the mistake that was made. And by the way, if there was a mistake that you can think of that it might have been possible to make back in the day was creating a disc, um, someone, someone made that mistake. And that's giving us all these wonderful variants and leaked bits of data. Uh, Mr. E, we only imaged two disks of that so far, and they're different. Um, common story, right? Uh, small number of disks, and the difference found right away. In this case, it's, it looks like there's some data at the end of the disk that is a corrupt image used to cycle between the sort of game adverts in the loader. And there's a, there's corruption slightly different on these two killer gorilla images. Um, what is that? What is that leaked data? Who knows? Maybe it's a bit of uninitialized memory from the developer's machine and there could be something there. I don't know. Uh, just an interesting way to create a, to cause a variant. This one I like. So a lot of these flippy disks, there's a 40 track side and an 80 track side. Um, the 40 track side seems to be, in some cases, pretty consistent and sane. But the 80 track side of these disks is kind of the Wild West. Uh, it seems like the amount of care put onto the 8-track side of original discs is, is less than the amount of, excuse me, the amount of care put onto the 40-track side. So the, an error that's quite common is where you write the first half of the 80-track of the, um, side with just a squished down version of the 40-track side. Um, you know, it's quick, it's simple to know what to write there, and you just leave the rest of the disc unformatted. So most of our strikers run discs look like this picture on the left here, you know, 40 tracks of something, 40 tracks of not formatted. But a few of them, you know, there's something left in the, in the second 40 tracks indicating that maybe the commercial duplication process um, stops after it's written 40 tracks, uh, assumes that the disc is unformatted, um, maybe for speed, uh, but it's not always unformatted. So in the middle, uh, we've got, um, a strikers run 80 track side written on top of a 40 track side. I don't know. So what happened there? Maybe someone had a, a, a run of discs in the hopper where they were the wrong way up, right? So they were like, oops, and dipped them over and, and did it again. And that's what you would see. But on the far right, um, this was a normal DFS discs 
uh, Ford 80 track, 80 track DFS disc before Strikers Run was written on it. And what's there? Well, it's the Strikers Run mastering program, as far as we can tell. So this is the program that Superior Software used to create from an unprotected disk, to create um, a protected disk from an unprotected disk by copying some files across and starting to issue some um, raw disk commands. You can see an uh, FFF1 in there somewhere, which is sort of how you call into the sort of um, fairly raw operating system disk routines to do some shenanigans. And uh, so, yeah, this is a really interesting program from a historical point of view. And I'm not sure if the complete thing is here. We should probably have a look. And if it's not, well, we just capture a ton more disks across the community. We may find a disk that does have a complete version of this on it or other interesting things on it. E-type memory dump. So we've captured two E-type disks so far, um, released later in the BBC's life cycle, smaller publisher, smaller sales run, I should assume. Um, so perhaps uh, not surprising that the amount of testing done was, was less. So one of the disks uh, loads fine on a master, but crashes on loaded as a BBC B, unless you chain the loader file instead of doing shift breaks. Uh, the other disk is kind of got that fixed, but the 80 track side fails on all machines. So it's like, whoops. Um, so a, a variant here, but when we started looking into what was different exactly, it's one of those cases again where the, one of the disks just has a bunch of extra stuff on it in the, on the unused sectors. And um, in the memory of the, or on the disk, appear to be fragments of the host machine's memory. So someone did a star save dummy file at some stage. That that's command is in this dump. And what they saved is like the ROM region, 8000 FFFF. So there's a copy of whatever uh, ROMs they had in their machine. and. You can see Acon Moss in this dump about halfway through. Uh, this is on the disk. Uh, it tells you that the developer ran this on a, on a master, I guess, if it says Acon, Acon Moss. Um, you could probably go and work out what exact version and, and tell a bit about what machine, um, I guess, Gordon Key may have had when he was uh, mastering this disk. On a Palace of Magic disk, uh, again, we found a bunch of the unformatted sectors uh, in, in the middle of the disk, I think, maybe in this case. Uh, were not rewritten, and uh, Palace of Magic was rewritten on top of a Play It Again Sam disk. So here's some, and the file that happened to be left behind, at least one of them was the, the title image, as you can see there. We've got an interesting Iridium variant, not investigated yet, other than to note that they totally changed the, the disk protection um, uh, radically, reasons unknown. Uh, is the game code different? No one's looked yet. So variants, variants everywhere. Um, there's just this, going back to my goal, my goal zero to sort of the hypothesis being that there's tons of interesting data out there we haven't captured. And maybe we can, if we're a bit methodical, capture it. I think hypothesis, at least for me personally, has been proved. There are variants everywhere. Uh, there's just this world of discovery waiting. Uh, you know, phase one, capture tons of stuff before it rots. Phase two, in, in, enjoy. And maybe those can be done in parallel. Um, some discs, yeah, we hit variants immediately. Uh, in or any given game where we had two discs, it was more common, I think, to have a variant than not, which is just staggering to me. Um, and uh, some, yeah, some discs we we did have three or four with no variant. That was very unusual. Uh, so there's definitely some interesting things here, I think. Um, I know we're getting on on time, so I'll go a little faster through the forensics. But um, you can tell a lot of things from a disk, but, uh, you know, just looking at um, looking at what you get back from it, other than the data bytes. Uh, you can do probably a better job if you use the um, you use Jasper's uh, BBC FTC as we just saw, because that's a lower level capture. But even on a BBC original hardware with the data coming through the 1770 disk controller you can tell a lot of what I find really interesting things. So this is one of those old Aconsoft discs, 40 track Arcadians, um, circa 1982, I guess. Uh, quite an old disc by all standards. And um, one thing that 1770 tells you as you read it, or doesn't tell you, but if you just, you can calculate it as you read the track, you just see how long the track is. You, you take back bytes from the disc controller until it stops. And then you've got a count of how many bytes are on the track. 
and this disc is all over the place it's like um in terms of just jittery it's like uh and we don't think this is copy protection where um there's no evidence for that this is just a jittery write so what, what was going on here uh, my guess is that they had a like 19 if this is 1982 they had one of their disk drives on the task was like some ancient 1970s beast that where the motor control technology just wasn't quite um wasn't quite as modern as some of the more more recent drives and the the motors were all belt driving the actual the actual spindle and so there's just just a jittery old drive which is and you can tell that just from these forensics here which is quite interesting uh different drives so um just to back up and go back to that superior software disk on the on the far right here strikers run where some we think something was recorded over something right the first 40 tracks were recorded over an 80 track disc so a bit of evidence of that forensically so the track 0 to 39 the length is a certain uh, certain length like a 3125 you know with a bit of wobble but not as much as that crazy drive we just saw like a wobble of one or two maybe and then for the next 40 tracks that we think are left over from some previously from some previous right uh, you've got a, a, a wobble around a different fundamental track length so that tells us forensically that a different drive was probably used to do that right, and it was just spinning at a different speed. A lot of them were because there's some there's a noticeable variance in in what, what speed the drives used to spin at, even amongst those that have got a fancy um, fancy like little chip to do motor control, you know, and a, and a decent direct drive motor. Um, you can tell you can you can make a good guess on how the disc was recorded. So Tynesoft had some really, really, um, really fancy protection on some of their titles. Here's my Winter Olympiad disc. And the length of these discs is just a little bit long, such that you would not expect the disc normal disk drive to, to be running this, uh, this slow, I think. Um, uh, so they had a, probably had a fancy disc duplication machine on the task, probably the same one that they needed to use to write Commodore 64 discs with all of the different speed zones. And you can tell it was written this disc was probably written with a fancy machine because of this fix-ups column here. It's like fix up zero or one all the time, which suggests that the disc controller syncs once and then stays in sync for the entire track. So there's no sort of there's no sort of uh, breaks where you write this sector at a time. It's just the case that we think that this disc was written track at a time and probably by some fancy duplicator based on the protection um, and uh, the, the track length. And also, if you look at the the actual content of the track there's some weirdness that you can't write with a, a normal bbc controller very easily uh, duplication markers uh on the 81st or 41st track of a disc if it's 80 or 40 track disc quite often if the disc was written with a, a fancy machine it leaves a little watermark a little duplication marker it includes, a, it includes a date so you get a birthday for your disc which is kind of cool um and uh, a little note about the sort of, I guess, the driver file used to make the disc. So this is the driver file here was Western something or other, uh, an interesting copy protection scheme by a company called Western Security. Um, and you can tell tell some interesting stuff from there. So if you want to contribute to, uh, to Disk Archival, how do you contribute? We'd love you to contribute, I think. As you've seen, there's value in lots of people contributing because we'll, the more people that contribute, the more of these great things we'll find. So generally, yeah, you know, find some discs. Uh, it could be yours, maybe your friends, right? So some people that have this big disc collections can't reasonably be expected to capture all those discs themselves. Uh, so maybe offer to help, or maybe you live near a museum. I don't know, but locate some original discs uh, and capture them using the most accurate uh, method at your disposal. I recommend Daniel Jay's talk here for going into some of the reasons why you want to just throw everything you've got at capturing to the most uh, most to the highest accuracy possible, because you can downsample later, but you can never upsample, right? And this ties in nicely with the talk we just saw about capturing raw flux from the uh, BBC FTC running on the on the Pi. Um, uh, that is better than Disk Beast. Let me be clear. You know, this talk is partially about Disk Beast. But Disk Beast is a way to enable more people to participate for people that don't have extra bits of hardware, they just have an old machine. Uh, you know, Disk Beast gets good captures, but not nearly as good, not as good as, uh, as if you can get a flux level capture. So if you can uh, do that, capture to a standard format. Uh, I think SCP is the 
closest thing we've got to a flux level format because Grease Weasel is already out there and it reads and writes it. That's also a format that existed, I think, pre Grease Weasel. And there's open source tooling under a permissive license to convert from SCP to HFE to, uh, to other formats. Um, I put this in before I saw the previous talk, but uh, you know, if you've if you've got a Raspberry Pi and you want to use the uh, BBC FTC um, solution to capture to SCP, that's going to be a much better solution than, than Disk Beast. Uh, but Disk Beast does get pretty good uh, accurate captures, and uh, that will that lets you make HFE files that run in an emulator or on a on a GoTech. You may have a bunch of disks you captured back in the day using a, on a legacy format like FDI, like uh, maybe a Cryoflux. If you do, send them over, and um, uh, some on the forum, probably me, uh, will step up and offer to help get those converted into something more standard and fingerprinted for you. If you, if you, need, if you need help doing it, we'll help you. If you need, just want someone to do it, we'll, we'll do it. Uh, specifically, you may have a disk. Maybe you've got a Strikers run. And you're like, ah, oh, they've already got that, so I eh, don't have to do it. Well, as we've seen, that's not the case. Um, even if we already have a disk, it may be the like twelfth capture of a given disk where we find that one disk that's got this crazy mastering problem that leads to a really interesting discovery. So please do uh, give it give it a go, uh, all your disks. Um, commercial software as well as games, right? If we're archiving, we don't want to be selective about any, about doing this and not that. Um, capture both sides of a flippy disk, even if the 40 track side seems to be a match to something we already have, because often the 40 track side is sane, and as we saw, the 80 track side is the, is the wild west. Uh, capture the track past the end. Most drives will step one past the end at least, fine. And there's some interesting data there to preserve, like the, the duplication markers. Uh, capture 80 tracks if you're not sure. We can discard the, the, the noisy tracks the, the, in the middle if they're, if they're not real tracks but we can't ever invent the tracks we didn't capture. Uh, yeah, and if you capture into SCP, you know, 81 tracks, uh, three revs per track, as, as we talked about, to make sure that if there's some weak bits there or, or a disk error, then we maximize the chance of being able to stitch back together a track that actually works. So um, capture so far, there's a spreadsheet here. I don't know if someone wants to paste that link in, into the chat if you want to click on it. I'll also be releasing these slides so you'll have the link. Um, I'll quickly... Yes, we'll quickly uh, quickly show that, but there's just a reasonable list of, of titles here, a bunch of acorns, all the stuff you might expect. Uh, uh, just to start, I'll call it, uh, just to start, we use to prove that there is interesting stuff here. And uh, feel free to have a look, look at what we've, look at what we've got. Maybe there's a variant there that is a game that's uh, close to your heart, and there are links here to, to the download. Um, on my Google Drive until we find a, a better hosting place. Feel free to grab grab any, grab all. Um, back to the presentation. Thanks to everyone that's helped get this going, um, particularly Tom Seddon, who was brave enough to write um, run my code run my code whilst it was still buggy, where that code talks directly to a disk controller chip. You know, brave gentleman. Thank you very much for helping debug disk beast and uh, just. Huge cast of people here who have invested time in improving those interesting things to find by capturing some of their own disks. Um, on to that, there, uh, well, on to Q&A, I guess. Um, if there's time, uh, there is the, I did promise to describe as a bonus how Disk Beast is able to write back disks, uh, including copy protected disks that couldn't be copied back in the day. So if, if I don't know if Big Ed's still on, that was his question, if he wants to to ask it, we can certainly certainly fit that in. But yeah, thanks very much for listening, and I'll uh, just switch back windows and uh, field any questions. Thank you very much, Chris. That was uh, another wonderful, informative talk. It's great to hear all this effort going into preservation and the tools to do it, and especially making it more accessible to people. Um, I think we'll take a few questions from the Q&A. Um, if you want to drop your questions in the Zoom chat uh, as per usual and send them directly to me. That's Phil P, Phil Pemberton. Um, and I'll sort them into some kind of order and we'll pass them along and we'll uh, get you to turn your cameras on or your voice if you don't want to be on camera and uh, you can ask your questions. 
Although while we're waiting for questions, it seems like this is the opportune time for you to show us the disc right back trick, uh, Chris. All right, let's quickly do that. I'll, I know a short time, so I'll sort of whiz through it. Um, let's see. Okay, yeah, so as I mentioned, this is a, a trick I don't think was found back in the day, and it will, it will copy pretty much any protected BBC disc, including ones that Disc Duplicator 3 wouldn't, wouldn't touch with a barge pot. Um, so it sounds, it sounds like, it sounds easy, right? You look at the data sheet for the 1770 and it's got this write track command. And it's like, great, we're done. Read track and then write track and then repeat for 80 tracks or whatever and we're done. Um, but if it was that simple, then uh, the, the disk copiers back in the day would have done it, right? So the problem is that when you write a track, uh, because that's used to format a disk, certain byte values are special and cannot be directly used. Um, so there's a, there's a value to write a CRC so that will write CRC bytes instead of the value you wanted. There's values to write uh, the special markers with different clock bits for sector headers. Uh, but the ones that are really um, tricky are these not allowed bytes. I mean, not allowed is a silly thing to say, uh, in my opinion, because of course you can pass them to the disk controller. You know, it's going to stop you. But it just results in it writing like a, a value other than that. So you can't write arbitrary bytes back to the disk using this, which is which sadness. Right? So. Um, but yeah, uh, so the trick is that we recognize that um, in, uh, I think we can skip skip this FM, FM bit, but uh, essentially the, um, the disk controller, when you write one of these data bytes, it writes back the data byte interleave with these clock bits that are all one. And uh, so, and that happens every four microseconds. And it's pretty simple actually. So every four microseconds, you either pulse the disk to write a, to do a, a magnetic flux reversal or you don't. Right? So is there some way we can do that without what, what sidestepping the, the headaches of, uh, of this right track command? Uh, the answer is actually yes. The, most of the trick is um, what we can do is we can, we can write an MFM track, a double density track. Uh, because the, the realization that unlocks this trick is that um, FM pulsing, like every four microseconds you pulse or you don't pulse, that is a subset of the pulsing of MFM. Um, so if you just use you know, the subset of MFM that only pulses every uh, four or eight microseconds, then uh, you can write whatever you want, uh, every, whatever FM you want, uh, clock bits, data, bit, data bits, uh, no, nothing will stop you. So the trick is simply you um, upscale from FM to MFM, so that sort of doubles the amount of bytes you give to the disk controller. Um, uh, but 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 resulting in FM being written to the disk. There's uh, one headache that crops up once you do that is that um, all of the data bytes you want to write, including F6, they come out as um, as a byte sequence that is not special or reserved at all. So it's like thumbs up. But when you write the sector header marker um, and you sort of write out the clock bits and the data bits you need for that. The sequence you have to write to the controller, unfortunately, includes F5 in it, which is reserved in MFM, a 1770 controller. So it's like, oh dear, is that game over? Uh, no. The part two of the trick is you just um, shift, shift the nibbles. Um, this works because if you shift the nibbles, then uh, because of what you need to write, it, this guarantees that you'll never hit one of these reserved values. You just don't encounter it if you sort of upscale and then shift. And it's okay to shift nibbles because at this point, you're dealing with a data stream, a pulse stream. So shifting nibbles just shifts timing by like 16 microseconds or something, um, which is harmless to rewriting the disk. Um, and you're, since you're dealing with a data stream, uh, you, you you don't um, you don't need to use any of the special the special values. So you can shift it when you're not you're not disturbing any special value you needed to use. And yeah, jobs are good. Um, I've tried this on a bunch of disks that I consider the trickiest to copy, and it, it copies the Sentinel. It copies that crazy TimeSoft disk we looked at. Uh, it copies pretty much everything. It handles weak bits as well. So weak bits is where the, you get sort of sort of random pulses back from, from the disk. Um, that's a bit tricky to, to emulate on a, on a 1770, or to cause on a 1770, until you realize that um, with MFM, you, if you do write back actual MFM to the disk, uh, you get um, six microsecond granularity uh, or deltas between pulses sometimes. 
And when read back as MFM, that makes no sense. That six microsecond pulse is right in the middle of the window where you need to separate a zero from a one. So you, as it reads it, it's like, oh, I don't know, and it kind of sometimes falls one side of the boundary, sometimes falls the other side of the boundary. You don't quite get weak bits, but you get something that behaves exactly like weak bits. Uh, so you can copy Shurston software, weak bits protection um, with this, and it just works. And that was, so that was kind of fun. A question from uh, Kieran Connell. Hey, hello, Chris. Uh, great talk. Thank you. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, I guess um, my question was, uh, well, do you think it would be interesting to have a talk from uh, one of the publishers to sort of have the, the flip side of the story? Like, I'd love to, to hear from them, like the, the realities of disduplication back in the 80s and like, whether they could fill in some of those gaps and whether there really was somebody kind of sat in their living room at the tail end of the BBC era, just sort of putting discs into a drive when the, when the orders came through sort of sporadically. But um, yeah, I don't know if, if Dave's had a chance to, to speak to anyone and uh, he might be able to talk, tell us about that. But uh, yeah, it'd be interested in your, your thoughts on that side. That, that would be a magnificent. I mean, the idea is, is magnificent uh, because the, that, I'm guessing from forensics about what may have happened, whereas having someone give those actual stories firsthand would, would, be, would be fantastic. And I guess the good news here is there's like 20 publishers we can approach and we just need one of them to, <laughs> to, to find someone from one of them that was there back in the day that remembers um, and, uh, and did this sort of yeah, thing from their living room, <laughs> maybe. Uh, so yeah, if we can get Dave to sort of do the rounds on that, I, I can certainly give some recommendations on which publishers seem to have the more, should we say, uh, interesting times uh, with, with trying to get their discs out. Um, yeah, I think that's great. Hopefully Dave is, is, here, is listening and, uh, and uh, ready to give it a go. Well, I've already put in the legwork, some of the legwork on that, Chris, and we will have pretty much what you're looking for next month, yeah? Um, except it will be a story from the bit, the early 80s. So it will be more tape duplication related. There will be some disc duplication in there, I'd imagine. But in terms of duplicating things in living rooms, um, yes, you'll hear about that next month. Watch this space. Right, so I've got uh, Pika Sonic Jasper with the next question, please. Hi, um, thanks very much for the, for the talk. Very interesting. Um, I guess there's a lot of overlap between the stuff that we do. Um, I was wondering, in terms of the fingerprinting, um, I've seen some discs where the sector ID address mark says that it's a 128 byte sector, but it's actually a 256 byte sector. So when you then go to read it, um, you only get 128 bytes back if you say read sector one, but actually if you ignore that and tell it to read a 256 byte sector, you get those other bits of um, the data. So the CRC, instead of being at the end of the 256, is also at the end of the 128. So th does the fingerprinting account for stuff like that? Um, yes, it does. So um, I think that you've described the elite disk. It either does what you described or the, in, the inverse of it. And that is the reason why it is not, the original elite disk is not 177D compatible, if I recall. Um, so it does account for that. So the, the way Disk Beast decides the sectors is it sort of, it doesn't really trust the sector header because you can't, because copy protection plays all these games. But it does trust the sort of physical timing between the last sector and the, and the current sector, or the current sector, I guess, in the next sector. Uh, so based on that timing, it knows how many bytes probably fit. So it makes a first guess based on timing. And that, that actually works like 99% of the time. For those times where it doesn't, it, it, before it decides it's a CRC error, it will check the other sizes that fit and uh, try and get a match. I think Biotrack is interesting disk because it sort of has, has huge post-sector gaps, but you can resolve it to a clean sector boundary if you um, try CRCs at the different possibilities. Um, so yeah, it does try to take care of that. It, the algorithm obviously isn't perfect. You know, if you were looking at it now as with an eye to break it, you could you could break it, I think. But that said, the disks have already been made and uh, what I've got, I think handles all known disks. Uh, if it doesn't, well, we could change it or probably we shouldn't because I don't probably don't want the headache of changing the CRC algorithm at this stage yeah, exactly. since it's working since it's working for 99% plus of discs. Great, thanks.
So, so what was this issue with 17 and 70 compatibility? Is it that it can't read sector lengths other than the one that's in the ID header? That you can't tell it uh, read 256 even if the sector says it's only 128? That's it, yeah. So the 8271, you tell it what you want to read and it will do it. The 1770, you, so you, you give it the length as well as the sector number and it, it'll do it. The seventeen seventy, you just give it like a sector number, and it 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 will it decides the length. Um, so that that is the reason. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is that if you've got an Acorn Soft like two point two six DFS ROM, there's this crazy key combination you can do that where it will try and it will try and do compact mode. It's like Control Z Shift Break with an ordering that's quite difficult to get right. Um, don't ask me to demo it, or maybe I can try if if there's time. But then what that does is it actually under the covers when it hits some some trigger I'm not sure what that is it will do a read track and then presumably parse the sectors out of that track and that is enough to get that elite disk to work and load and I've tried it on a real machine because I've got that elite disk and I've got a 1770 and it, it actually it actually works but it actually sort of has to fall back to read track and parsing sectors itself best I can tell. So this is this is a it's doing this as part of the Oswald Seven F thing, is it? You you, you tell it to read uh, a sector, and it actually does the retract behind the scenes. Yeah, I'm not sure what triggers it. I think maybe it detects that the sector header is like crazy or something, and then maybe that is indicative of Aconsoft's early protection, and that then it should try again doing its crazy mode. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely a definitely a thing. I will, whilst the next question comes up, I'll see if I can find that elite disk. I've actually got a quick question to follow on from uh, Jaspers. So you, your CRCing over the data, does that mean that you're, um, you're not going to catch things like out of order sectors or sectors where the two sectors have the same ID or have falsified sector IDs? So for instance, a 19, a uh, 10 sector disc that has a sector number to 100, for instance. So um, it'll capture all that fine. It won't necessarily trigger a fingerprint mismatch on it. Um, or sector ordering it will, because if the if the sectors if the sectors are ordering ordered differently than the um, physically ordered differently, then the CLC of digital will change based on that that reordering. Um, but yeah, if you've, it is possible you could maybe construct a disk that has some differences in the sector header only. Uh, that said, the thinking here is that um, if there's a if there's a significant difference, you know, that's relevant to the copy protection, then the code in the sectors, the loader code, will have had to have changed as well, right? Uh, and this is what we've been, this is what I've seen, and the loader code will have had to have changed to cater for the different expectation of these weird sector headers, and that will cause the disk overall to take a different CRC32. Uh, you see that in the elite disks, I think. So we're not yet aware of any you know, things we've missed. Um, and it's one of those things where you could construct a disk um, if you, the, the kind of wouldn't trigger as a variant or a couple of disks that wouldn't trigger as a variant, but where we don't think that is a situation that arose back in the day. Uh, if we get counter evidence, we can make some adjustments. So if you knew it was CRC, you could deliberately build something to cause a collision, but how likely is that? Yeah, there's a lot of things you could deliberately do to confuse Disk Beast or the CRC. You know, if you know what the body of BBC Disk is, but since that's not changing, I didn't I didn't focus on making this you know super secure bulletproof. I just uh, focus on making it work for every known case. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for a very informative uh, talk again, Chris. It's been an absolute pleasure having you, and uh, thank you also for Q and A at the end. Thank you, thank you. Hopefully, I've been inspired people to go and uh, archive some discs. Absolutely. More of a merrier.